You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile, and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time, there's Granger, offering professional grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 175, The Invasion of Norway, The Recapture of Narvik. This week, a big thank you goes out to Blake, Charles, David, and Kara for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. You can find out more about becoming a member over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. On May 7th, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Neville Chamberlain, would speak before the assembled House of Commons in London. The topic of the day was the events that were occurring in Norway, and had been occurring for almost a month. The entire sequence of British decisions were up for discussion, but of particular note was the decision that had been taken to pull British troops out of central Norway, abandoning the entirety of southern and central Norway to the Germans. Chamberlain would say this, quote, It became clear to us that we could only maintain our forces in the Trondheim region by such a concentration of men and materials and aircraft as would have drawn off altogether an undue proportion of our total resources, and in these circumstances we decided that we could carry on the campaign in Norway elsewhere with greater vigor and effect. So, thanks to the skill and courage of all three services, we successfully withdrew all of our forces from the Trondheim area. End quote. The decision to evacuate the British forces, even if Chamberlain tried to put a good face on it, would have important ramifications on the actions of all of the armies in Norway during the early weeks of April. This episode will discuss some of those ramifications, as the Norway campaign shifts from a desperate attempt to contain the Germans in southern Norway to an even more desperate attempt to try and cling to the areas of northern Norway that were still under Norwegian control. If there was any hope that northern Norway could be held, then the absolute first priority would be finally dealing with the German troops at Narvik, because without Narvik as a base of supply, it would be impossible to keep the supplies and men in Norway that would be required to halt the German advance north. Back in Norway, among the Norwegian government and military leaders, the actions of their allies up to the start of May had done nothing but cause an increased level of pessimism. They had been forced to evacuate to the city of Tromsø in far northern Norway, with civilian government arriving in the city on May 1st, and then the remaining officers of army high command arriving on May 3rd. This was a moment in which all the Norwegian leaders were trying to determine if there was any viable path forward to continue to resist the German advance. General Rouge, the head of the Norwegian military, would work on a memorandum on his way north to try and answer that very question, and every answer led back to the need for renewed Allied support, a renewed Allied response. Rouge specifically called out the need for more fighter aircraft to try and counter the almost complete air superiority that the Germans had enjoyed since the very beginning of their invasion. He would go so far as to say that German air power was the most important factor in the defeat of the Norwegians in the south. Rouge would also meet with General Fleischer near Narvik on May 6th, with the two officers determining a separation of duties that fit both their ranks and the overall situation. Fleischer, although technically under the command of Rouge, would have complete control of the Norwegian troops in the Narvik region. Rouge would focus all of his energy and that of his staff on coordination with the Allies and trying to acquire supplies and military equipment that they so desperately needed. This exact arrangement would not end up working out perfectly, mostly because Rouge just could not stay out of events in Narvik, which was the only real area of continued Norwegian military resistance. The only good news for the Norwegians was that it would take some time for the German troops to reach the areas around Narvik 
the only path for them to take was almost 500 kilometers from Namsos in the south, and then along a road called Route 50, which was actually in relatively poor condition. There would be many instances where the Germans would be forced to use ferries uh, to, to get over water obstacles, which would slow them down. In peacetime, coastal ships were the way to move through this part of Norway, but the presence of the Royal Navy greatly sort of hindered the Germans' ability to use those coastal vessels to move their troops. After the Germans arrived in Namsos on May 4th, they would begin their advance with the 2nd Mountain Division. This division had originally not been assigned to actions in Norway, but was added in late April due to concerns in Berlin that there were not enough German troops in Norway to successfully link up with those that were trapped in Narvik. When the 2nd Mountain Division began advancing, the Norwegians started asking for help from the British and French, specifically to begin to man some kind of defensive area to the south of Narvik to slow and, and maybe even stop the German advance north. The British just simply refused to land any kind of large force at this point in the campaign. Instead, they would land a series of five independent companies, each made up of about 300 officers and men, who were designed to kind of work independently in Norway to try and slow the Germans down. They were then placed throughout the areas south of Narvik where it was felt they were needed most. While it was possible that these groups could slow the German advance, there was no possibility that they would be able to fully halt it. While there were efforts to slow the German advance on land, and the terrain was working against any kind of quick German advance north, there were attempts to speed things along from the German side in some unorthodox ways. One of these was through the use of a Norwegian coastal steamer, which was a small ship that was loaded up with personnel from the German Navy and then as many German infantry troops as could fit aboard. They brought with them a small artillery piece and some machine guns, which were positioned on the steamer to be able to fire while it was moving through the water. The goal for this ship was to move north to the Norwegian city of Hemnensburg, about halfway between Namsos and Narvik. Once it got to its destination, it was going to get the supplies and men it carried to ashore as quickly as possible. This was a risky mission because it required an almost 500 kilometer journey along the coastal waters of Norway. And if it was discovered at any point, there would be serious problems because we're talking about a coastal steamer here, not a warship. If any British warship comes within range, uh, it's going to sink. Somewhat miraculously, the luck of the little steamer would hold all the way to Hemnensburg. But it would be after that it docked that the timer would start ticking on it. Because just over an hour after it had started offloading its supplies and men, two British destroyers would begin their attack, sinking the little coaster steamer with their guns. Most of the supplies and men got off the ship, but there were several wounded that could not be evacuated in time. This effort was a really good instance, a really good example of the Germans kind of, you know, using their ingenuity and perhaps uh, recklessness, I guess you could say, to try and make their advance north happen even faster. They, they recognized that the, the clock was ticking, the, the timer was kind of running out for the men around Narvik. Back in London, there was a growing frustration at the lack of action from the military commanders around Narvik. This frustration was more than shared by the Norwegians, who were simply flabbergasted that the British were refusing to really commit their firepower to action. They had complete control of the waters around Narvik, and a decent number of troops in the areas around the city, and they just weren't really doing very much. Some of the major challenges that Admiral Cork and General Mackesy, sort of the, the British leaders, would face during this period was a combination of unrealistic ideas from London and a push from the Norwegians for them to do literally anything as quickly as possible. Back in London, there were ideas that were communicated to Cork and Mackesy that were simply divorced from reality, like landing north or south of Narvik and then just marching troops to the city as if this was possible in any way due to the harsh weather and the difficult terrain. But this did not prevent calls from action, and so Admiral Cork decided that the only thing that could be done was to just launch a direct attack against Narvik, an action he had preferred a week before when the first British troops arrived in the area. Cork scheduled this operation for May 8th, and Mackesy planned on landing two battalions of troops just a few kilometers from Narvik itself, and this would allow them to immediately attack into the city. Mackesy and Cork would get resistance from other British officers, 
With this resistance based on the excuses that there were a lack of boats to get them in ashore, there were very short hours of darkness so far north, which meant that the men would be exposed in their approach, and the troops in their open boats would be completely vulnerable to German air attacks, which the Allies had no answers to. While these were all valid criticisms, they fell largely on deaf ears. The fact was that there were 25,000 Allied troops in the areas around Narvik, and they had to do something, and soon. There would be conversations around the particulars of what would happen, but something had to happen, and so it would. But there were some discussions about maybe using different troops, which is where the French came in. The French General Betuar was present and in command of the 13th Demi Brigade, which contained both Foreign Legion and Polish troops. Along with the shift in the troops that would be executing the attack, there was also a change to the exact target, because instead of landing close to Narvik, the objective of the French attack would instead be the Norwegian depot at Elfgardsmoen. One of the members of the Foreign Legion, far more experienced in desert fighting in France's African colonies, would say that, quote, Ha, ah, it is all very difficult. We are used to traveling on camels across the desert, and here they give us boats and we have to cross the water. It is very difficult, but it will be all right. I think so. End quote. Regardless of the confidence of some of the men, there were serious problems that the French troops would have to overcome if they were going to be successful. The first was a simple lack of landing craft of any kind, which meant that they would have to be landed in two much smaller waves. The attack also had to be postponed due to a lack of transport space, as the ships that were going to be used to move the men into position were being used to move supplies to other French and British units scattered around northern Norway. On May 12th, everything would finally be ready, and the 1,620 assault troops would climb aboard the various watercraft that would transport them to the target. Before they went ashore, there would be several hours of naval bombardment in the areas around the landing beaches. This bombardment would take around two hours, and it would come at the cost of civilian lives. When they were planning the attack, it was understood that there were still Norwegian civilians in the areas that were to be bombarded. And to try and minimize the number of civilian casualties, General Fleischer would make radio broadcasts telling civilians to leave the area. These radio broadcasts risked a larger German response, but Fleischer and the Norwegian leaders believed that it would be worth it. The problem was that the radio broadcast gave an incorrect deadline for the evacuation, stating that civilians should be clear of the area by Saturday, but then the attack was delayed a few days so that many of them who left their homes returned, putting them directly back into the line of fire when the attack did begin on Monday, so it was a delay from Saturday to Monday. 17 Norwegian civilians would die during the bombardment and the fighting that would follow. What the French could not know is that the naval bombardment probably was not even necessary due to how weak the German defenders were in this area. This was because almost all of the German defenders had been moved out of the area around Evegardsmoen because they were needed to meet the French and Norwegian attacks in the north. This meant that when the landing started, there were only a small number of German sailors, the survivors of some of the German destroyers that had been sunk during the second naval battle, that were left defending this area. The German sailors put up a very limited amount of resistance before retreating. While losing Elfgardsmoen was a problem for the Germans, it was far less of a problem than it would have been if it had occurred even a few weeks earlier, because the volume of supplies at the supply depot, which was so important, had been heavily depleted by the Germans during their period of occupation. The German leaders were also well aware of how exposed they were, and early in the morning of May 13th, as the attack began, orders were already given for the troops in and around the city to retreat to the east. This would create a new defensive line that connected the defensive lines in the north to a fjord that was positioned to the south. The German commander in Narvik would not learn of this move until early in the morning of May 14th due to some bad radio links, but once he was informed of the situation, he was just glad that they had been able to successfully retreat from a very dangerous situation. In their post-action report, the German officers on the scene genuinely attribute this fortunate series of events to French and Norwegian mistakes, not their own brilliance. The fact was that there were now even more Allied troops in the areas north of Narvik and they had been heavily supported by British naval fire, which the Germans could not prevent in any way. And yet somehow, the German defensive lines were able to hold together, even if they had to give up territory to do so. 
For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger For the ones who get it done. After the successful landing of the French troops, a conference would be held between British and Norwegian leaders at Harstad on May 16th. Both Rouge and Fleischer would attend, along with the British leader, General Auchinleck. There were two major concerns that the Norwegians wanted to bring to the British in the hopes that they could assist. The first problem was ammunition. The Norwegians had started the war with limited supplies, and the fighting over the previous weeks had, you know, made it a bigger problem. This problem was greatly exacerbated by the fact that most of the weapons used by Norwegian forces did not use the same ammunition as the Allies, which made resupply difficult. Due to this mismatch, the Norwegians wanted ammunition, but they also needed weapons to go along with it, and they were told that both weapons and ammunition were on the way from British stockpiles. While this was, I guess, an accurate statement, those weapons would not end up in Norwegian hands because they were instead given to some of the British units that had a portion of their weapons lost in an attempt to land at Boda, which was to the south of Narvik, and in the path of German advances. The other Norwegian concern was that they wanted renewed efforts to stop the German advance as far south as possible. The Norwegian focus was on the city of Moirana, and the airfield that was nearby. Every airfield in northern Norway was important, because they needed to keep them out of German hands, because once they were captured, it allowed the Luftwaffe to move its air superiority umbrella even further north in greater strength. Some units of the Scots guards had already been sent to Moirana, but Achenlech stated that he would try and find more to send south. The Norwegian leaders would leave the meeting with at least some hope that the British agreed that they needed to try and push troops south to hold off the German advance as far from Narvik as possible but the commitments made by Achenlech were uh, flimsy and would largely be overtaken by events. But the one thing that the Norwegians wanted most, because they believed it would have the greatest impact on the course of events, was the commitment of British air power, but this was slow in coming. There were Norwegian airfields that could have been used to base British aircraft out of at this point, which were close enough to the fighting to be useful, but they would not really take any advantage of them until the end of May, mostly due to a lack of willingness to commit more valuable air resources to the fighting in Norway. On the other side of the line, after the French landings were successful on May 13th, the situation for the German defenders in the area around Narvik got even more desperate. The supply and manpower situation was bad, and had very little hopes of getting meaningfully better. Meanwhile, there were countless small episodes of bombardments from British ships, and there was theoretically the threat of a landing happening in a large number of areas along the coast, all of which had to be guarded. Dietl would inform High Command back in Germany of how the situation was deteriorating, and that he expected the Allies to launch an attack directly at Narvik in the coming days. At the same time, Dietl believed that they may not have to launch such an attack because of the continued threats in the north from the French and Norwegian forces who were slowly grinding their way south. There would be a point where their advances would make Narvik no longer tenable for the German forces, and they would have to give up the port and retreat further to the east and into the mountains. There were two pieces of good news. As the German front to the north continued to collapse south, it became shorter, which made it easier to man, which at least slightly alleviated the German manpower problems. The second and more important to the overall course of the Norwegian campaign was a piece of good news, and that was that the German invasion of France had started on May 10th. While the invasion of France was far to the south, it would have a critical impact on the course of the Norwegian campaign in the weeks that followed, as all eyes shifted to what was happening in northern France. On the 13th, it was still quite unclear how quickly the French would be defeated. Guderian would cross the river Meuse at Sedan on the 12th, but there were still some hopes among the French military leadership that counterattacks would restore the situation. But even if the campaign settled into a longer fight in France, 
it would inevitably pull focus and maybe even resources away from the French and British efforts in Norway. With the benefit of hindsight, we can say that the final critical moments of the fighting around Narvik and a major reason for the eventual Allied defeat in Norway could, would come from the fact that they did not immediately attack Narvik and then launch an all-out effort to eliminate Dietl and his command as soon as the French were successful in their landings on May 13th. This may have given them time to move all of their forces south and stop the German push north at a point where northern Norway was prevented from falling into German hands, before the situation in France got to the point of total collapse, which would cause a lot of problems in June. There were plans to quickly move on Narvik as early as May 19th, but as so often happened, these plans were delayed. The initial planning for the attack on the 19th was led by the French, who collaborated with the British naval officers to prepare for the attack, but the 19th date would be pushed to the 23rd of May due to a lack of landing craft, which were being used in efforts to get a nearby airfield up and running to operate land-based aircraft. While it was lamentable that this delayed the French attacks, it was considered absolutely essential to get that airfield up and operating as quickly as possible due to increased German air activity. This was because, as the German forces continued to push north from central Norway, the presence of German air power over the Narvik theater increased, with both ground support sorties and direct attacks on Allied installations around Narvik increasing. Carrier aircraft were able to meet some of these German efforts and would also launch some direct attacks against German-held airfields, but there were simply not enough of them to turn the tide. The new date of the assault would slip from the 23rd to the 25th to the 28th. At the same time, the Norwegians and the French would pause their attacks on May 22nd from the north to allow their troops for some rest time and some reorganization. This was a very fortunate development for Dietl, whose entire goal by this time was just to buy as much time as possible. It also appeared that all of his efforts to hold on to Narvik were starting to pay off because the Luftwaffe started to increase the flow of reinforcements that were flown into the Narvik area. During the first half of May, only 133 men were flown in, but just in the last week of that month, 671 soldiers were brought in. Some of these men would parachute into the area, even though they had very little actual parachute training, with troops from mountain regiments just being given the briefest possible jump training before they were dropped over Narvik. Now, this was actually probably an area where the German method of parachute dropping was actually a benefit, even though it would cause so many problems during most operations later in the war. Because the German parachutes gave the jumper absolutely no control of where they were drifting or where they would land. This meant that even inexperienced parachutists could not cause any problems for themselves, because they didn't, couldn't do anything. The end result was that instead of the 10% casualty rate that was expected among the mountain troops that jumped into Narvik, there were actually only two very minor injuries. The combination of hundreds of additional men arriving in the contraction of the total zone of German control meant that the possibility of further delaying the final collapse of the German positions was actually increasing, not decreasing. After almost 10 days of delays, late on the evening of May 27th, British warships entered the fjord near Narvik to begin their preparations for the landings. In preparation for the landings, Allied units in other areas around the front would launch their own attacks to increase pressure on German defenders everywhere. About five minutes before midnight, the landing craft carrying the French troops of the Foreign Legion would begin to make their final approaches to the landing sites, which were being doused in naval fire. Several of the possible landing sites were covered by only weak German forces, a situation forced on them due to a lack of any information that would reduce the number of possible areas that the French or British may put troops ashore. This meant that when the first wave came ashore, they met almost no resistance. By 2.30 a.m., both the second group of French legionnaires and members of the Norwegian battalion that would follow them were ashore. The Luftwaffe would eventually arrive and begin to bomb the assembled British ships and landing craft, and this would have two important consequences for the overall course of the landings. The first was that it delayed the arrival of more troops, as it was felt that the approaches were not safe enough. The second was that the total amount of available naval fire support was reduced to avoid any possible damage from the air. These two consequences, when combined, allowed the Germans to launch a counterattack which would slow the advance of 
and allow more time for all of the other German troops in the Narvik region to retreat. By the middle of the day on the 28th, even these problems could not prevent the French and Norwegians from taking Hill 79, an important area which allowed for a good view of the entire city, which was obviously being very quickly abandoned by the Germans. The French commander, General Betuar, would send his official message at about 10 p.m. on the 28th that the city was captured, the first city, really, to be retaken by Allied forces during the war. It had cost around 150 casualties, almost entirely French, Norwegians, and Poles. The Germans would retreat out of the city and begin their fighting retreat along the rail line that ran to Sweden. And so by the end of May, it had finally happened. The German invasion of Narvik on April 8th had finally been reversed, and it was time for celebration. If the Allies could quickly eliminate the rest of the German resistance and then turn their troops south, they could finally stop Germany's advance north. Finally, they were in a position to ensure the long-term survival of some areas of Norway under Norwegian control, which would be invaluable in the fight ahead. Or they could just abandon them completely and give up on Norway. But surely they wouldn't do that. Right? Right? 